Hi, Peter. Welcome to Amplus. Thank you very much, Bernie. It's a delight to be here. It's not my first time, but I always enjoy coming to Amplus. Well, that's great. So please come in. Thank you. Hey, Peter, I understand you were actually born in India and educated in the UK. So can you tell me a little bit more about your childhood? Because it's yeah. fascinating. And what takes you to come to Hong Kong? Well, uh, my father was in the equivalent of the, of the Foreign Office at the time. Uh, and he was based in Calcutta, and uh, that's where I was born. So we were not there, they were there for seven years, but I, I came right at the end of their posting. Uh, but they left uh, Calcutta in December and were posted almost immediately to Finland. Uh, and so I was then brought up in Finland and Bulgaria uh, and, then, and then came to the UK. So I guess that gave me something of a taste for, for, for travel and overseas living. Because I know you as a banker, so what's life before <laughs> banking? Because it must be you must have different career. Choices. Well, it's a, not really actually. I, um, I I've only I've only ever had uh, three jobs in my career, which is unusual for somebody in banking because we have a history of sort of jumping around. Um, but I was so I, I went to school. I went to school in the UK. I then went to Oxford University, uh, which was uh, a great privilege, of course. And uh, when I emerged from Oxford, I joined uh, an accounting firm. So I, I joined what was then Coopers and Librand mm -hmm. and is now PwC. That's right. And, uh, and I did my accounting articles there. I qualified. And then I moved into banking. So I joined uh, UBS. And then after UBS, I came to Standard Chartered. So I've only had three jobs. Wow. And what made you decide to come to Hong Kong? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, to some extent, these decisions were not really mine, they were offered to me. Um, and uh, I had a, a boss in London at the time, I was doing something called equity capital markets in Europe, actually. Uh, and we'd just done some big transactions, we'd just done the Adidas IPO, <laughs> we'd done the IPO for Merck, and they wanted to kind of build up uh, the, the business in Hong Kong. So I was asked to, to come here. There was already a team here, but I was asked to come here and and look after that team. So I did that at the end of 95, beginning of 96, thinking I was only going to be here for two years, actually. Uh, but uh, two years became uh, 10 years, became 26 years. Now, but what was your first impression when you first came uh, to Hong Kong? Was that a, a cultural shock to you? Well, I suppose so, but I, I can't really remember feeling uncomfortable or shocked out of my skin in any way. I was brought up overseas as well for uh, the early part of my life anyway. So I was very keen to come, come overseas and Hong Kong was offered. I'd spent a bit of time prior to that in Singapore and Jakarta actually, but only sort of weeks at a time. And I was asked to come to Hong Kong and I sort of grabbed the opportunity because I thought this is something that you know, I want to experience. It's not just a, a good career move. Now, I understand uh, your three daughters yes. were born in Hong Kong. Yes. And you yourself is a permanent resident of yes. Hong Kong as well. Yes, yes. So this is really home for you. Yes, it is. It's become our home. And it's, it's interesting, you know, when you make a choice, a personal choice, in some way, you are more vested in the community than if you happen to be born mm. there. And, Three girls, all born here, uh, went to school here. Um, they're now all in the UK, actually, but uh, they still have deep roots in Hong Kong and love coming back. Great. Well, in fact, on that note, um, for that 25, 26 years in Hong Kong, how about um, in terms of your circle of friends? Now, apart from your work colleagues, did you manage to make uh, friends, uh, local friends, and friends beyond the financial industry? Yeah. Uh, well, not to begin with, to be honest, I think to begin with I was so immersed in work and, uh, and what I was doing that my circle of friends tended to be those that I was working with as well. But like you said, you know, for those who've been here and, and are residents here, then you realise yeah. the city has so much yeah. to offer. So yeah. if you would be someone arriving new to Hong Kong, yeah. what advice would you give them? Well, first of all, don't, don't, don't even question whether or not you should come. You should, you should definitely come. The, the opportunities here are manifold. Um, and when you get here, kind of just immerse yourself into, into, into the society, into a, probably a small group of people or friends that you'll get to know at the beginning, and then gradually expand that. We're sitting here in M+, so you've got all of this cultural perspective in Hong Kong now, which is terribly, terribly exciting. So it's a, it's a modern, 
cosmopolitan city, but with this backdrop of, of the country parks and uh, the rural setting, which make it unique and special. You mentioned the Amplas, so I understand that you are actually very passionate about culture. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit what you're passionate about? Well, I do think it adds a perspective to your life, you know. It's very easy to go through, as me as a banker, very easy to go through life just crunching numbers all the time. Uh, but it's incredibly important to develop uh, EQ, uh, emotional uh, quotient as well. And, um, you know, I think that's what the arts do for you. So, uh, I remember the first time I came to M Plus and also to the Palace Museum, I came with fairly high expectations, mm -hmm. to be honest. Uh, because I, I know West, from my day job, I know West Kowloon, we've done some work for West Kowloon, some advisory projects, for them. so I know, I know the project reasonably well, but I hadn't been into any of the buildings, of course, until they'd opened. And uh, I, I walked out of them on a complete high. You feel very content, you feel very satisfied, you feel like you've got answers to the world's questions, although you haven't. Well, it took us a long time to it get did. to where we are. I mean, for the longest time, Hong Kong was considered, you know, sort of like a, a, a cultural desert. You know? But now, of course, with uh, both uh, Amplas and Palace and many more. So how significant do you think these cultural institutions in Hong Kong, uh, for Hong Kong, beyond a financial center, and not just for Hong Kong, obviously, but for regionally, right? Yeah, very, very significant, I think. Um, I, I can't understate um, how special they are in the first place, uh, but also how significant they are. And for people, I think they're hidden. They're hidden at the moment. I don't think we've done enough as a community in Hong Kong. Really, I'm sure you're working on it, but to uh, to to promote what is here, because I think when people come here, they will be amazed. They will be challenged. They will be a little bit shocked by what's happening in these places, because. Uh, I think it does not necessarily meet with Western expectations of Hong Kong today. And that's, that's all basically Hong Kongers, right? So it appeals to the local community as well. And when the international community and the mainland community here, I think this place will be, you'll, you'll have queues around the block, I think, and the word will be out. People will come here especially to, to visit these places. Very, very special. I'm right. so excited. Peter, the link between Hong Kong and the UK run very deep. Obviously, with our deep history between the two places. And how, how do you see that? I mean, obviously, it, it cut across uh, from culture, people, to businesses. How do you see the, you know, how do we see this relationship continue to develop? Well, you won't be surprised to hear me say that I want to nurture it and deepen it and develop it because I think it is very special and I think it can be overlooked if we're not careful um, and we must continue to treasure it. They cut through the legal system, the accounting system, the banking system, the regulatory system, the financial system, you know, even the side of the road we drive on, traffic signs, uh, you know, very familiar to anybody who arrives. Peter, you are the chairman of the British Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. And your chamber is considered perhaps the largest, if not the most influential chambers in Hong Kong. So as chairman, how do you promote uh, perhaps more trade and collaboration between the UK and Hong Kong? And what about your members? What, is, what are your members' interests? You know, how do they see this continuous relationship between Hong Kong, UK, and China yeah. to continue? Well, look, I think, I think we see it collectively as very important and um, with enormous prospects. Um, I think you have to look at the, the membership of the British Chamber as well because we have members who have had businesses in Hong Kong for a very long time. You know, my own bank has, has been here 164 years, I think, Standard Chartered. Um, and, um, but not only been here a long time, but also have got big domestic businesses. I think we claim, although I don't think we've ever really tried to audit it, that as a chamber we, we, we represent or we have members who are 
uh, probably the largest, collectively, the largest private sector employer uh, in, in Hong Kong. And if you think of Jardine, Swires, HSBC, Standard Chartered, the Pru, the law firms, the accountants, you can see how we get there quite quickly. Um, so they have large domestic businesses, but they're also many of them in the service industry. And so they need that infrastructure, the ecosystem that Hong Kong offers. So the deeply developed, long-standing rule of law, the judiciary system, the accounting profession, uh, all of which are very closely mirrored by the United Kingdom. My job as chairman is to represent the member interests, but also to remind people of those opportunities and to encourage businesses to grow and prosper and invest here because it's good for them and, 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 and good ultimately for both Hong Kong and the UK. Peter, you mentioned Standard Charter. I understand you are the Senior Managing Director for Standard Charter Bank, and your bank, from my understanding, has been in Hong Kong for ages. I think your first branch was opened back in 1859. Mm. That's a long way, mm. right? So uh, obviously, banking is a major part of Hong Kong ecosystem. So how do you see um, Hong Kong's role in the future in global banking? Uh, look, I think it's already very established um, and I think and hope that it will go from strength to strength. Uh, Hong Kong is, has got this unique position as an international financial center, uh, so it can serve obviously the mainland of China but also uh, the region as well. And so Hong Kong continues to have that, that enormous role of uh, acting as a, uh, as, as a connector between um, you know, the mainland, the broader Asian community and the rest of the world. This must be the Hong Kong special DNA. Mm. Well, I think uh, given the very rich history of Hong Kong and, the, and also these institutions, but we need to continue to evolve. Peter, let me ask you about the Hong Kong as an international financial center. Yeah. Now, clearly, uh, it's been a very challenging three years. You know, from uh, you know, we have social unrest, we have the pandemic, and of course now we have geopolitical tension. How do you see Hong Kong's continue to move forward as a global international financial center? Well, I think it's established as a global international financial center already. It has the history of having done that. And when you think of international financial centers, you, you think really of New York, London, and Hong Kong. And there are other centers around as well. And each of those centers have been challenged, actually, in the course of the last three to five mm. years. New York, by some extent, as a result of the geopolitical tensions. London, as a result of Brexit. And Hong Kong, as a result of the things that, that you've noted there. Um, but for me, the most important thing is that we begin to bring people together again because only then can we resolve any differences that there may be and only then can we see the advantages of working together. Now, you've been to so many different cities uh, in Asia and the rest of the world. Now, how do you see Hong Kong uh, so uniquely different from other cities? especially in continue to staying ahead in, you know, as a status as a financial center. So what are our unique features in Hong Kong that you can't find anywhere yeah. else? Well, I think it goes back to that formulation of one country, two systems. So uh, Hong Kong is China, uh, but at the same time it has its own separate system. And that system is, um, is a very valuable one. It's a very, very valuable one, not just to China and the region, but to the rest of the world as well. So. You have a common law system, you have an independent judiciary, you have an open capital account, a freely convertible currency, um, uh, you have the development of you know, offshore systems for China like the RMB internationalization and, and the Connect schemes. Trade has always been uh, China's DNA uh, because you know, we, need, we need to meet the demands of the people. So I can only imagine the uh, these type of trade initiative will continue and yeah. Hong Kong play a very important role yeah. in it. Right? Uh, Hong Kong is incredibly important for trade. I can talk as a bank, you know, our, our, our trade finance business in, in Hong Kong is, 
is, is, is, is big and I think it's one of the biggest that we have around the world and, and most of it is related to, to China as you can imagine. You know, I think the statistic I remember is even last year in, in the depths of the pandemic, the Hong Kong Airport Authority was the largest cargo airport in the world, bigger than uh, bigger than the UK or the US. Um, and that's a result of the transshipment of goods that come out of China through Hong Kong and go out to the rest of the world. Can you use three words? to describe Hong Kong as the international financial center? So first of all, I would say it's a very fair place. It's a place where fairness prevails. So it's a kind of meritocracy, if you like. You can, you can get on in Hong Kong if you do the decent thing. It's also very fast, uh, so things happen very rapidly. And it's also very flexible, you know, the way Hong Kong can shift over to exploit a, another opportunity has always amazed me in the last 26 years. So is that, those three F's, there we are, that's fortunate. So fair, fast and, and flexible, but underscoring it all is this, is this respect for the rule of law, this respect um, for process and regulation, uh, which make, uh, make Hong Kong a very um, stable place as well to do business.